Lord, we love you, Lord. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the God that you are. We thank you that, Lord, despite the circumstances, despite the, the struggles, and we get it, Lord, life is filled with ups and downs. We are attacked as Christians. It is the battle that we are in. But, Lord, through it all, help us to be mindful of how big you are. Lord, you're greater than all these things. And Lord, you are faithful to take care of your children, Lord God. Your word says that. And I can testify, Lord, all my life, Lord God. Uh, again, you have been there, Lord. You promised never to leave us nor forsake us. You promised to be with us to the end. And so, Lord, we rest in that. I thank you this morning for those that you brought out, Lord God. Bless them for their diligence. Bless them as they, for their faith to trust in you. And so, Lord, we, we just ask that you'd meet with us, Lord God. We want to worship you, Lord, even in our study of your word. And so you be glorified, Lord God, in our hearts. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Good to see you this morning. Let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11 this morning. Hebrews chapter 11. Okay, good to see you guys this morning. Again, good to uh, be in church this morning. I'm excited to be with you and, and uh, uh, again, to, to share what I'm about to share. Hebrews chapter 11 this morning. Well, as I mentioned, again, my, my family and I, again, uh, my wife, the girls, their husbands, we spent the last six days in, in Cabo San Lucas and, uh, and, and had a good time and, and uh, it was wonderful. Again, it was wonderful. I'm glad to be back with you this morning, but we, we did have a good time. And, and I'm, I'm a firm believer. My wife will tell you again, she especially understands the need for a vacation. Okay, and she was on me. She's like, "We're going to take a family vacation this year. We try to do it at least once a year." And uh, again, she pushes me to do it, and and I need that push. And the reason I need that push is because I'm a very busy person. Okay, without exaggeration, I am busy. You know, with a wife, four kids, six grandkids, and the ministry, I am busy nonstop. Okay, every single day, I am doing something. I uh, I shared with you before one of the pieces of advice I was given as a baby Christian was stay busy, okay? Stay busy specifically in the things of God. Why? Because when you're busy, right, especially in the things of God, you don't have time to sin. I don't have time for that, right? I remind myself, even when I'm tempted, I don't have time for that. And it has kept me on track again 33 years now serving Jesus. It's a good practice. I encourage you to stay busy. But Sometimes in my busyness, I can be so busy going and so busy doing and so busy staying busy that I can lose focus even in my busyness, okay? And if you're like me, again, I, you can relate exactly to what I'm saying. You get so busy, you get caught up doing what you're doing that you lose focus. And so let me ask you an interesting question this morning. In your busyness, when is the last time you thought about heaven? I'm not talking about just thought, thinking about it. I'm talking about when's the last time you gave serious thought to the fact that one day you are going to be in heaven, and I believe that day is a lot sooner than we think it is. When's the last time you stopped? Again, we're so focused living, we're so focused working, we're so focused on this and the next thing, and I'm with you. So when is the last time, especially as Christians, who, as Christians, we believe we're going to be there? We are going to spend eternity there. When's the last time we just thought about it and focused on it? I think Satan's tactic is to get us so caught up in this world that we never think about the next one. And we're impacted for that reason. Our lives are impacted because we don't think about heaven as we should. When is the last time you thought, who's going to be there? Or who's not going to be there? What's it going to be like? What are we going to be doing? When are we going to get there, right? And I think probably the most important question at all, of all, do I really understand how to get there? These are all important questions. These are all things that we should contemplate because heaven is a real place. And that is the place, again, that we are going to be with God throughout all eternity. I read a quote many years ago, and the quote said that we need to mind ourselves with the future 
Being that, we are going to spend the rest of our life there. We better think about it. We better give focus and attention to the future. Because when we don't, when we're so caught up on the here and now, we get ourselves in trouble. We become distracted and we don't have the focus that we need to. Now again, I mentioned we just spent six days in Kabul. But we prepared for it for three months. We booked the flights. We scheduled the hotel, right? Rental car. Excursions. Restaurants. All these things, again, we planned, we prepared for, we gave thought to. We didn't just show up at LAX at 8 o'clock and go, hey, let's go on a flight today, right? Everything was planned out. The schedule was made. We truly spent time thinking about these things. For three months, we planned for a trip that was only going to be six days. Now, we are going to be in heaven for how long? Shouldn't we plan for it? Shouldn't we be preparing ourselves today for where we're going to be throughout all eternity? It makes sense. But we don't, because we're distracted, because our focus is so much on the here and now, when, if we truly believe that we are going to spend all eternity in heaven, we should be planning for right now. We should be preparing for it right now. You know, oh, as the months went by, and all of you that, you know, we've all been there, we all go on vacation, right? We understand, we start thinking about it, don't you? Start imagining yourself in the water. Imagine yourself again going here, going there. And you, you find joy. And for that reason, again, it causes you to make changes. It causes you to live differently. It causes you, again, to do what needs to be done to make sure, again, that trip, that time is everything you want it to be. And I love it because, again, when we do that, it impacts our life. We begin to make changes right now for what we're going to be enjoying later. I heard a pastor say that you can tell a lot about a, a, lot about a Christian by how much they think about heaven. And I think that makes sense. Because those Christians that truly spend time thinking about heaven are impacted today in the life that they live. While those Christians that never think about heaven are not. Because there's, even as Christians, still focused on the here and now when we need to be planning for that future with God. Okay? Very, very important. Now remember, the Scriptures tell us this. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2.11, he says, Dear friends, I warn you. It's interesting. It's a warning. He says, I warn you as temporary residents. When's the last time you considered your, the fact that you were a temporary resident on earth? He says that we're foreigners. You know that? We're foreigners. Why? Because this is not our home. Our citizenship is in heaven. Someone say amen. This is not our home. And yet we can be so focused on building our lives in this place when it is only temporary. We become distracted. We bought into the the lie of Satan that we need to live for the here and now. And we're not planning and preparing for heaven, right? He tells us, I warn you to keep away from worldly desires. The temptations of this world, the temptations of our flesh that cause us to buy in and live for the here and now when God has so much better in store for us in the future to come. Jesus said, remember, what did he tell the disciples? Let not your heart be troubled. And I love this passage. How about today? Because we got a lot of troubled hearts today. We get so many people stressed and fearing and worrying about the circumstances that they're facing in the here and now, these words are for you. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, Jesus says, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go away to prepare a place for you. This is not our home. He's went away to build our home. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Is that a promise? Can we take Jesus at his word? I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. We need to hang on to that. That is for us. That is for all the children of God, that he's coming back for us. He's not leaving us here because this is not our home. He has gone away to prepare a place for his own. Which teaches us a lesson. That heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Are you preparing yourself? Or are you just living for the here and now? I'll say it again. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. This life, guys, is temporary. The struggles that we face, understand, I know we face struggles. I go through it. I'm attacked on a daily basis, but I recognize this is only temporary. Let me ask you, despite what you're facing right now, if Jesus came back tomorrow, would it even matter? When we can have this perspective, we can trust our God. We can get through whatever it is that we might be facing. But not only that, When our focus is in the right place, when we remember what the scriptures teach us and recognize this is not our home, but heaven is, it will cause us to live differently. And that's the way we're supposed to live. We're not supposed to live like the rest of the world. Remember this saying, you might have heard it, very famous Christian poem. C.T. Studd said, soon your life will soon be past. And only what's done for Christ is going to last. It's only what we do. It's only that life that we live for Jesus Christ that is going to last. The stuff that we focus on for the in this world, it's going to burn. None of that stuff is going to matter because none of that stuff is going to remain. This morning, let me ask you, are you preparing yourself for heaven? If you believe that is your home, this is what we are called to do. Can I get an amen for that, right? Lord, help us. All right, let's talk about Hebrews this morning. Let me remind you again, if you don't know Hebrews 11, it's one of the most famous chapters in all the Bible. It is known by many as the Hall of Faith, okay? A Hall of Faith. And the reason it's known for that is because chapter 11 recounts the lives of many of the Old Testament believers, the Old Testament saints, The lives of faith that they lived as they trusted in God, as they did not live for this world, but they lived for God. And for that reason, their lives made an impact in this world. And their lives are set forth in chapter 11 as an example for all of us to follow. They are examples. Their lives and what they did and how they lived lives of faith in God are examples that all believers today are to look at and learn from so we can follow in their footsteps of faith. Now, I love it because after you read chapter 11, Paul, or some say Paul, in chapter 12 says this. Therefore, in other words, now that you've read these examples, therefore, since we Christians are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, have you ever considered that in heaven there are all these saints, believers that have died before us that are like witnesses watching our lives. It's incredible. Since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us, what are we supposed to do? What should we do? Let us strip off every weight that slows us down. You know, one of the mistakes that Christians make is we say, well, I'm not sinning anymore. That's good. I'm not doing this sin anymore. But oftentimes, even though we're not sinning, we involve ourselves with things that are not helping us move forward in our Christian life. It's not necessarily sin, but it's a weight slowing us down. And so the writer says, we need to get rid of that weight. You imagine a marathon runner running with leg weights on his legs? Take that stuff off. It's only slowing you down. And that's what the writer says. We need to cast that aside. 
things that, again, might not necessarily be sin, but it's just slowing us down in the race that God has called us to run. Let us cast every weight off, but especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Of course, when it comes to sin, we need to cut that stuff loose as well, because it's only going to trip us up in our walk, in this race with God. Let us do these things and then run with endurance. Hanging in there. We're going to go through difficulty. We need to endure in this, the, in this race that God has set before us. And so the writer of Hebrews says, after you've read Hebrews 11 and understand the example set for you, let us then do the same. Let us then live lives of faith as we cast off the weight and the sin that slows us down and trips us up, and then continue to live that life that God has called us to do. Okay? This morning, we're going to look at three things. Three things that living a life of faith focused on heaven causes every believer to do. Okay? Very, very important. I've entitled the message, A Heavenly Focus. Okay? We're going to look at Hebrews 11. I'm going to cover the verses from 1 to 26. We'll be jumping around a little bit. Hope you brought your Bible. We'll look at what having a heavenly focus causes us to do. Again, I'm going to give you three things. The first of which is that having a heavenly focus causes us to sacrifice today. Okay, Having a heavenly focus causes us to sacrifice to God, to give Him our best. Let's pick it up here again. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. For by it, for by faith, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. And so the writer of Hebrews opens up the chapter explaining to us two things. Number one what faith is, and number two, what faith is for. Very, very important. He answers these two questions. Number one, what faith is. Well, he tells us faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Now, your Bible might use the word confidence. It might use the word the guarantee. Or I believe the New King James Version says faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now, I love the word substance because the word substance has substance. Does that make sense? It has substance. The word substance means to stand under, to support as in a foundation. And so I love this. Read it this way. Now, faith is the substance or the support of things hoped for. The writer tells us that faith, not in faith, but faith in the Word of God, right, is the support we need for the things hoped for. Where do we find our support? In God's Word. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And so, faith in God's Word is the support for the things we hope for. In other words, we stand on the foundation of God's word, which gives us hope for the things that God has promised in the future. Does that make sense? Very, very important. This is what faith is. And this faith is not just wishful thinking. It's just not, I hope, I hope, I hope. No. He says it's assurance. Okay? It is sure. We can trust it. Why? Why? Because God's word is truth. And because God is faithful to his word. And for that reason, if God said it, that settles it, right? If God says it, that settles it. And that's why he goes on. It is not only the support of the things hoped for, but it's the conviction of things that are invisible, right? Of things not seen. Now, your Bible might use the word evidence, it's the evidence, the evidence that we can trust. Even though we can't see it, we can trust it because God said it. And so I'll say it again. It's not, I hope so. It's God said so. 
And so long as God said it, is it going to come to pass? Of course it is. And that's why the writer said, look back at verse 3. It's almost like he could have said it this way. Don't forget that by faith we understand that the universe was created by God's word. The same word that created the universe is the same word that can bring everything else God said to pass. And so as you look out and you see the created universe, you know that everything else God said and God promises is sure. Just as sure as the universe around us. This is what faith is. We can trust it. It is sure because it is supported, right, by the word of God. The Old Testament saints believe this. They believed in the certainty of God's word, which is why it led them to live lives of faith in their God. And this is what the writer goes on to tell us. Verse 4, by faith, Abel... Cain and Abel, we know the story, offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than his brother Cain, through which Abel was commended as righteous. God commending Abel by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though Abel died, Abel still speaks. Now remember the story very quickly. All the way back to Genesis chapter 4, we have the story of two brothers. Cain and Abel. Well, in this story, both of them bring a sacrifice to God. No doubt taught by their parents, right? About the importance of sacrificing to Almighty God. And so what happened? Abel brought forth the first fruit of his animals. Likely a lamb that he brought forth to give to the Lord, to sacrifice to the Lord. Cain, instead of doing that, went and got fruit from the ground. And he brought that to the Lord. Abel gave what was special to him. Abel gave what truly cost him. Cain simply gave what he gathered from the ground. Abel gave his best. Cain gave his second best or third best or fourth best or whatever you, you want to call it. For this reason, we read that God commended Abel for his gift and God accepted the sacrifice that Abel gave him, but God did not accept the sacrifice from Cain. Now, what's interesting about this, and I want to make it clear, both of them offered a sacrifice to God, but God only accepted Abel's sacrifice because what Abel gave truly cost him something. What Abel gave was truly valuable to Abel. Let me ask you this, that if what we sacrifice to God is really not valuable to us, like, hey, it's just no big deal. If it's no big deal to us, why would it not be that way with God, right? Right? How can we expect it to be a big deal to God for God to say, oh, thank you for what you've given to me, when what we offer to him is of little value to us? And that's the story of Cain and Abel. In order for our sacrifice to God to be accepted, God desires that we offer him our best. Should God be pleased with leftovers? Should God be pleased with second or third or fourth best? No way. And we see that God was not. What we offer to God should always cost us something. And we find this lesson also in the life of King David. The Bible declares in the book of 2 Samuel that King David wanted to build an altar to worship God. And he desired to build it on the land of a man named Aaron Yua. And so, David goes to Aaron Yua and he asks for the land to build an altar to God. So Aaron Nua tells David, who was the king, you can just have my land. If you want it, king, it's yours. But David said this. This was David's reply. 2 Samuel 24, 24. But the king said to Aaron Nua, no, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me 
nothing. David understood in order for God to accept him, his sacrifice, it had to be of value. It had to cost David something. And so even though the land was offered to David and David could have simply accepted the land, David said, no, in order to please my God, in order for my God to accept my sacrifice, it must cost me something. And so he purchased the land for 50 shekels of silver. Now, I will agree with you, I'll be the first to agree with you, that sacrificing something for God is never easy. It's always hard. It is always hard to sacrifice. So why do we sacrifice? Why should we sacrifice? Because in offering something valuable to our God, we demonstrate that regardless of the value or high value, our God is more important than our sacrifice. And that's what we show God when we offer Him our best instead of offering our second best. Jump down to verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing, key word, rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Moses considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. What an incredible life Moses had. Born into Pharaoh's house, growing up in the palace as the son of, or adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. He could have stayed there. He could have enjoyed all the pleasures of sin. He could have enjoyed everything we would say this world had to offer. But what did he do instead? He chose. Do you see the choice? He chose instead. He sacrificed the fleeting pleasures of sin. And he chose instead to live for God. Moses chose to sacrifice the temporary for what he knew was eternal. That's what he did. He made this choice, right? Why? What prompted him? Well, he, we see the answer. He was looking to the reward. He recognized, right? Right? What this world has to offer is nothing compared to what God has in store for those who love them. Love Him. How about us? What choice are we making? Are we choosing again the things of this world over what God has in store? How foolish that would be. Moses had it all. Moses had a life that none of us could have ever had or ever do have. And yet, he recognized Regardless of what this world has to offer, it's nothing instead of what God has in store. What a lesson. What an example. Lord, help us, right, to have this perspective, to have this heavenly focus. Now, as I mentioned, I'm with you. Like you, I'm human. Like you, I'm selfish. And sacrificing is hard. It's hard. Every single day. Every single day, it is hard to make sacrifices. But let me ask you something. Is giving up sweets hard? How about carbs? Is giving up carbs hard? One of my weaknesses, Lord help me, right, is bread. Oh, Lord help me, right? I could eat bread like there's no tomorrow, right? Don't get me near an Olive Garden or Red Lobster, right? I'm in trouble, okay? I, lo I love bread. Pizza, pi I eat pizza every day. I, I, I would eat pizza every day if I could. I love it. Hard, hard to do, right? My wife will tell me, stop eating so much bread. And I'm like, Jesus ate bread, right? <laughs> it's hard. But, ladies, let me ask you a question. Specifically. If giving up sweets or carbs will help you fit into a smaller dress, would you do it? Right? Makes sense? You're going to something fancy or special, right? Going on vacation, if it's going to help you get into that bathing suit, is it worth it? 
Once you get there and you're able to fit into that outfit, yeah. Interesting, right? Interesting. Perspective. How about sticking to a budget? Is that hard? Yeah. Sticking to a budget is hard. Try not to spend money. You look out and people are buying new cars and this and that and you're still driving your old clunker, right? And it's hard. Trying to live off rice and beans and top ramen, that gets old real quick, doesn't it? But you know what? When you're able to do that for three months or six months or a year and then pay off all your debt, was it worth it? You and I both know it's worth it. It's all about perspective. It's all about having that proper understanding. Yes, sacrificing is hard. I am with you. Telling myself no when everything inside of me says yes, I'm with you. It's hard. But when you understand that what you will one day receive for your sacrifices is so much better than the sacrifice itself, it's no longer a sacrifice. You know what it is? It's an investment. We need to invest in eternity, guys. We need to invest in our spiritual futures. Now, I'm not just talking about money. It's, I'm talking about everything. So often we get so sidetracked by money. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about doing whatever it is that God's called you to do. Being willing to sacrifice so that you can live the life that God has called you to make. And I love the examples, right? Abel sacrificed, gave God his best. Moses sacrificed so that he could give God his best. He was willing to sacrifice it all for God. Let me ask you, do you think they have any regrets today in heaven? No way. You know, as Christians, we so easily say that God is number one on our priority list. Oh, we all say that, right? Who wouldn't say that? But do our lives show that he's number one? Are we really living that life, that sacrificial life that God has called us to live? Again, we, all we can got to do is look in the mirror, right? Lord, help us. We are settling. We are settling for the things of this world when God has so much more in store. The question is, do you trust your God? The question is, do you have faith to believe the promises of God like evidently Abel and Moses did. Lord, help us to learn from their example. I think, again, it's so valuable for all of us. And so number one, if you're taking notes, having a heavenly focus causes us to be willing to sacrifice. Sacrifice today for what God has in store tomorrow. Let's move on. Second thing. Having a heavenly focus causes us to walk by faith. To walk by faith. Look at verse Five. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before Enoch was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Very important. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that God exists and that God rewards those who seek Him. Interesting. Without faith, we can never please God. If we do not believe our God, believe that He exists and believe that He rewards those who seek Him, we are not pleasing God. We are not living a life that is acceptable before God. Now, Enoch, very interesting person in the Bible. I'll be honest, I wish there was more written about Enoch, but th there's not. All we know about this man is that he had faith in God. Is that he trusted his God. And that faith in God pleased God. And so what did God do? God Caught him up to heaven. Now, what's interesting about Enoch, again, he is one of only two people in the whole Bible that we know about that never died. Can you imagine that? Never died. Him and Elijah. Only two. In all of Scripture, God just took them home. Amazing, right? Amazing. But Enoch specifically tells us why he pleased God. 
He walked with God. He trusted his God, and God just said, come home. And God just brought him home. Lord, help us to, to, to live the same life, right? To walk with God daily, to trust our God, despite what we face, despite the circumstances. That's what God is calling us to do. And that life of faith, again, is what pleases God. Why don't you hold your place in Hebrews and let's turn our Bibles to John chapter 20, okay? Hold your place in Hebrews. Go to John chapter 20. We'll go back to Hebrews in a second. But we all know this famous story about living by faith instead of by sight, okay? John chapter 20, I'll begin reading verse 24. John writes, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin was not with them, the disciples, when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, <clears throat> Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. That's what Jesus told them. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God, because he believed. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Jesus commanded him, stop doubting and believe. Believe me, right? Believe me. And then I love what he said. Jesus told him, who are the blessed? Who are the blessed? Those that even though they don't see, they still believe. Those that doubt, they're not blessed. Jesus told us very simply, right? Who are the blessed ones? Those that believe. In other words, those that doubt are not blessed. And I think this is interesting. Jesus just, draw, he just drew a line right here. You want to be blessed? Then trust me. You want to be blessed? Believe me, Jesus said. You want to keep doubting? You're not going to be blessed. And I think this is a simple lesson that in order to be blessed, we have to live a life that pleases God, right? And that is a life of faith that trusts in our God every single day. Do we understand as Christians that faith was not something that we demonstrated just the first day we got saved? But we are called every single day to live a life of faith. Isn't that right? Every day. We get up in the morning, we trust our God. And this is important, why? Because we're going to go through battles. We're going to go through circumstances. We're going to face difficult times. All of us, every single one of us, is always going to be going through something. It's just a part of life in this, this fallen world. And so what do we do when, when the hurricane comes? The rains come, the storms of life come, because they're coming Regardless if you're a Christian or not, they're coming. So what do we do? Well, the answer is we trust our God. We stand on His promises. And that's what enables us, to, again, to make it one more day, guys. Just one more day. Just keep serving God one more day. Some of you might be struggling, wondering if it's, you're about to give up. Just hang on. Just one more day. And as you trust in your God, God blesses you. And God gives you that strength to endure. He honors you. He honors the faith you put in Him. And so this is that life that all of us, every believer, needs to have. And I believe especially as we look out and we see the, the troubled times that we're living in, we have troubled hearts. The answer is not to doubt your God, but to stand on the promises of His Word and know that our God is faithful, okay? That our God is faithful. So let me ask you this morning, do you trust your God? We need to, doesn't He? I mean, he, He's proven Himself, hasn't He? 
We can trust Him. We can trust Him with our lives. We can trust Him with our marriages, our families, our circumstances, our finances. We can trust Him in every matter because He can see us through. Our God is bigger than our circumstances. Again, He's bigger than the hurricane. He's bigger than all these things. And if we doubt Him, what are we saying to Him? If we say, God, I don't know, God. I don't know if you can get me out of this one. I don't know if I can trust you, God. You don't know what I'm facing. What are we saying to God? Remember what the Scriptures say. Romans 14, 23. Whatever is not from faith is sin. If you tell God, I doubt you, God, I don't think so. If you doubt, if you express unbelief, disbelief towards God, you're worrying that He can't help you. You're stressing because you can't fix it and you don't think God's going to fix it. All that's sin. Because you are saying, God, I don't think you're big enough. I don't think you can handle what Satan has thrown at me. And the Bible says that attitude of fear and doubt and worry and stress, all of that, that is the opposite of faith. Therefore, that is sin. Not the life that God has called us to live. God has called his children to be children of faith. Which is why the writer of Hebrews instructs us. Very important. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what has promised. Right? One day we're going to receive the promise. What God promised. One day, right, we're going to be in glory. One day, all of the struggles that we are facing, the stuff that you're, is causing you to pull your hair out right now, is going to be a distant memory. And we will receive all that God has promised for us. That's what we need to focus on. That's what we need to remind ourselves. And he tells us, verse 37, Yet in a little while, and the coming one will come and not delay. He's coming back soon, guys. Don't you believe that? But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Those that turn back, those that walk away, those that doubt God. God says, I have no pleasure in them. But we, the writer of Hebrews says, are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. That's who we are called to be. That's who the true children of God are. We hang in there, even when the rubber meets the road. And we trust our God, and we believe our God is going to see us through. Enoch lived a life of faith. He walked with his God. He lived in a fallen world just like you and me, but he walked with his God. And his faith pleased God so much that God did what? God took him to heaven. He took him to heaven. May we too live a life of faith that pleases our God so God will do the same for us. Amen? He too will take us to heaven. Let's go back to Hebrews 11 and we'll look at the third thing. Okay? Hebrews 11, we'll look at the third thing. Number one, having a heavenly focus causes us to sacrifice for God, giving God our best, it causes us to walk by faith as we draw near to Him. Number three, it causes us to fear God. Fear God. Why? Because if you believe His promises, you know the future. You know what God's Word says. It causes us to fear Him, motivating us to obey Him. Look back, Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God, Concerning events as yet unseen. Interesting. God warned him about something that hadn't even happened yet. In reverent fear, Noah constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, Noah condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive an, as an inheritance, and he went out, not knowing where he was going. 
By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. Verse 10, why did Abraham do this? For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder was God. You look at two men here. Noah, fearing God, no doubt, obeying him. Abraham, fearing God, which caused him to obey him. And what I love about both of these men, again, think about both of these men. Remember the story of Noah? Prior to Noah, it had never rained on the earth before. God tells them he's going to flood the earth with rain, and there had never even been rain. Noah might have said, God, what's rain? God said, don't worry about it. Just do what I tell you. Build the boat, right? Did he do it? He feared God. Yes. God says something. I'm going to do it. He didn't have the answers. He still did it. How about Abraham? Abraham, I want you to leave your home, your family, leave the land of Ur, and travel to a land I'm sending you to. Did God tell him where he was going? No. God said, just keep walking. I'll tell you when you get there. That's what happened. He did it. He feared God, and he obeyed God. Now, these men are incredible examples because God commands us to do things. Does God always tell us why we're supposed to do it? No. Let me ask you, does God owe us an explanation? Who do we think we are? We think God has to come down here and explain himself. God simply says, this is what I'm telling you to do. I'm God, and you need to do it. But he allows us to decide, doesn't he? To decide to choose to obey him. That's what happened. These two men chose to obey God, and God blessed them for it. Their fear of God motivated them, again, to obey God's word. And it's so sad when we, because God hasn't given us all the answers or explains what he's doing in our lives, we don't listen. He doesn't tell us what we want to hear, so we don't do what God tells us to do. How foolish that is. How different that is from the life of faith that we find in the Scriptures. Do we understand that one day we're all going to stand before God? Not because I say so. That's what God says. That day is coming. And those that chose not to fear God and not to obey God are going to have to give an account for doing so. That's what the scriptures tell us. We find this, Revelation chapter 20. The Apostle John, remember, saw the revelation. He received the revelation. And he says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. That day's coming. God sees what we do. He sees whether we listen and obey or whether we say, God, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm living for now. I'm living for today. Heaven's a million years away. And I think how sad that is. How many people today, Lord help us, how many of us in this room think that, you know, heaven, is just, that's 100 years from now. Or 80 years, or 70 years, or 60 years. I'll worry about that when I get there. How many people have that mentality? My heart breaks for this generation. It really does for this generation. Because I wonder how much of this generation is so distracted by today. So caught up in the here and now. Not thinking about tomorrow. Not focused on their future. But you and I both know. That day is coming sooner than we think it is. That day is coming. All we got to do is look out and we see what's happening in this world. Greatest country on earth is, is, being, is going down the toilet. It is, and it's heartbreaking. Heartbreaking seeing what's happening, seeing sin and demonic activity everywhere. We're seeing it in a way we've never seen it before in our lives. All, I believe, pointing to the fact that God's about to wrap things up. And so whether you think Jesus is coming back tomorrow or not, 
We don't know when our day is coming, do we? How many of you know young people die every day? Youth is no guarantee that we have 50, 60, 70 more years. What we do know is what God says is true. Judgment day is coming, and we need to be mindful. We need to fear God, which will motivate us to obey Him, following the example, again, of the men we find in the Scriptures. Let's wrap it up, verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. I love it. They, 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 in faith they saw it. And having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desired a better country that is the heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Their focus was heaven. They were not caught up. They recognized they were strangers and pilgrims in this world just passing through, and they looked forward to the place that God had prepared for them. What an example for us. Let me ask you, is heaven your future home? And if so, are you preparing for that place now? Because this is what we are supposed to do. And when we do, again, it will change the way we live today. C.S. Lewis, he said, when you read history, you find that Christians who did the most for the present world were precisely those who thought the most of the next world. It is since that Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they become so ineffective in this world. What a difference being focused on heaven makes in our lives. The more we think of heaven, the more it will change us. The more it will prepare us. Which is why, last verse, Paul says in Colossians 3, 1 through 4, he says, if. Because that's, that's the question, if. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. May we have this hope. May we have this focus on heaven, on the future, being careful not to be distracted and caught up on this present world. And when we do, again, we will live that life that matters, that life that makes a difference, that life that is blessed by God because we honor our God with our faith. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Once again, Father, we... We thank you this morning, Lord, just for our time together, Lord. I pray, Lord, you speak to us. Let it be your spirit, Lord. Never me, Lord. Let it be you. That you would draw hearts close to you, Lord God. That you would increase our faith in you, Lord. That you would motivate us, Lord God, to be willing to sacrifice today for what you have in store tomorrow. That we, again, would walk with you every day, trusting in you despite the circumstances of life that we would fear you and be motivated to serve you. Let that be who we are. Speak to us by your spirit, through your word. Draw us closer to you this morning. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We give you the glory you alone deserve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand.